This is Brian Schwartz from the University of California, San Francisco. I'm an infectious diseases doctor, and today I'm going to be talking about sepsis. Sepsis is a syndrome uh, that you may have heard about. I think it's commonly discussed with a lots of different types of infections. The learning objectives for this session is for you to recognize the epidemiology of sepsis and septic shock, define the following, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, frequently known as SIRS, sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock, and then list some of the common monitoring and treatment strategies for sepsis and septic shock. So sepsis is a clinical syndrome which complicates many different types of infections. It's not due to one specific infection, but it can be due to lots of different ones. And what happens is the body's normal immune response becomes dysregulated and causes an excessive amount of inflammation. Risk factors for having an infection that leads to sepsis is advanced age, uh, hospitalization, having an abnormal immune system, whether it's from immunosuppression or treatment for cancer. And mortality rates are quite high. Depending on the study and the severity of your illness, your mortality rate may be lower with something like SIRS, um, our sepsis, only 7%, but once you go into septic shock, uh, almost half of people will die related to this. So what's going on with sepsis? Um, why, why does our body do this? What is the pathophysiology? Well, the underlying molecular processes are happening. Are First, the toll-like receptor um, is stimulated and it identifies usually bacteria, uh, one common toxin, lipo, uh, polysaccharide endotoxin uh, here um, is recognized by the toll-like receptor on macrophages. Uh, the macrophage then, um, once its, act its toll-like receptor is activated, uh, NF-kappa B uh, stimulates the macrophage to start producing uh, cytokines, chemokines, nitric oxide. And what do these do? They reach out to other cell lines like the neutrophils to come in uh, and, and activate themselves. What do neutrophils do? Well, they release further pro-inflammatory agents, um, which further stimulate an inflammatory response. So what's the clinical result of something like this? Well, you get reduced vascular tone and leaky capillaries, so you can get edema, you can get erythema, so redness, swelling um, is, is what happens. You can once it's systemic, and this is happening not just in one area, uh, if you had an infection and inflammation at the arm in the setting of infection, you might just be red and hot and swollen. Um, however, if this is going on systemically, you could develop dilation of multiple blood vessels and you could develop low blood pressure or hypotension, and then that can result in poor perfusion of many organs of your body, and this can be quite severe. So let's go in and talk about some of the definitions again. So remember the cascade is SIRS, sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. So SIRS, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, is defined as having greater than or equal to of two of the following. Temperature dysregulation, so either fever or hypothermia, tachycardia, tachypnea, or having an abnormal white blood cell count. And that can be either be, like with temperature, it can be very high or it can be very low, or you can see an increase in the number of bands, which is an immature form suggesting that a stress response is happening. So that's SIRS. SIRS isn't necessarily always caused by infection, and you wanna remember that there are non-infectious causes of SIRS, such as pancreatitis, uh, severe burns, trauma, ischemia, or hypoperfusion of an organ can release uh, inflammatory cytokines or allergic reactions. So when you see somebody get a SIRS, you need to stop and I decide whether you think it's an infection, which it'll probably be in many cases, but there also can be non-infectious causes as well. So now when you have SIRS, but you have a suspected or pro proven source of infection, that's when you're worried about it. That's when the definition changes to sepsis. Sepsis can be due to multiple different types of infections. It can be due to pneumonia. It can be due to kidney infections. It can be due to skin and soft tissue infections, uh, like in this case of cellulitis. Sepsis um, 
when you then have evidence of organ dysfunction or inadequate perfusion, so when you start having a systemic inflammation, um, you start having dilation of blood vessels, and then you can have that organ hypo, uh, hypoperfusion. Um, and when you have severe sepsis, some of the signs of organ dysfunction can, as I said, you can have hypotension, so you check a blood pressure and it's low. You could have hypoxemia or low um, oxygen uh, in tissues. Your kidneys could um, be underperfused, so you could be making poor urine and you would see an elevated creatinine when you check the lab. You could become acidotic from having poor tissue perfusion. Um, the inflammatory cascade can consume platelets and result in low platelets or a coagulopathy. Your brain can uh, be poor perfused, poorly perfused. You can have an altered mental status. Um, another sign of organ hypoperfusion is an elevated lactate level, or you can see elevation in liver enzymes if you're having poor perfusion of your liver. So these are some of the signs of organ dysfunction you want to look out for in a patient who has severe sepsis. So now severe sepsis becomes septic shock when you have severe sepsis, plus you've given them lots of intravenous fluids to try to relieve this hypotension, but it continues. So severe sepsis plus hypotension despite fluid resuscitation is now septic shock. So you may have heard the term shock before, and I'm just gonna take a brief moment to remind you some of the different types of shock. So there's hypovolemic shock, so these are kind of self-explanatory, um, being that you have low volume on the inside within your blood vessels. And so what are ways to lose volume? You can have hemorrhage, you can bleed out, or you can have diarrhea, you can lose it through your GI tract. So those are two ways to get hypovolemic shock. Cardiogenic shock, as the name implies, your heart is not working very well, so that's cardiogenic shock. And then distributive shock, um, septic shock being one of them, you can also have this dilated blood vessels with other things like anaphylaxis, or sometimes if people have spinal cord injuries, they can also have a reflex that we call neurogenic shock, and they can have um, a, a distributive form of shock as well. But today, when we're talking about distributive shock, we're focusing on septic shock. So what do you do if you have a patient with sepsis or septic shock? Well, first you wanna stabilize their breathing, uh, making sure that they can get oxygen, uh, get rid of the carbon dioxide. You wanna then assess and maintain their tissue perfusion. So you wanna monitor their blood pressure. You can look and draw blood lactate levels to see if they're having hypoperfusion. When your tissues are not being perfused well, your lactate level goes up. You will put in an IV line or a central line to obtain access to then give them intravenous fluids to try to fill up those leaky blood vessels. If that's not working, then you're going on to having septic shock, and then you might give them vasopressors, so actually medications that will tighten up those blood vessels. But they come with risks in themselves. And then at the same time, you want to be identifying the infection and controlling the infection. You want to give early, broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy based on the type of infection that you think you have, and you want to do source control. So if they have a big abscess that's causing this infection, you want to drain it. So this is a summary of SIRS and septic shock. Uh, you can use this for your review. Um, and uh, thank you for listening.